And I guess I respect the decision when when you feel like you failed at something, it's like I got to move on and, and do something else. I, it just so happens that I was the only one who didn't. But yeah, I, it, it, I, it, it was an abandonment thing for me because I'm still here and you're all gone and you all gave up. And essentially you gave up on me because I'm still the one here, right? So I felt really alone. And also, you know, as a, as a founder, it's a really lonely place. If you have a co-founder, great. You have someone to bounce ideas off of and you have someone to vent to or, you know, you can go for a coffee and just talk and vent and say your, talk about your frustrations and things like that. And I had nobody to do that with. Welcome to Beyond the File, the podcast where we talk to leaders and entrepreneurs about their biggest business failures. We'll deep dive into how they overcame these setbacks, the lessons they learned from them, all to help you gain valuable insights. Failure is an essential part of the business journey, as well as being the key to success. So we're here to show you how to thrive from it. This week, I'm joined by Sonia Kutu. Sonia is a two-time tech founder with 17 years experience in the industry, and she is the managing director of three software companies currently. She also holds a position on the board of directors for the Canadian Foundation for Diabetic Research. She also holds a position on the board of directors for the Canadian Foundation of Dietetic Research. And she has received multiple awards for her services in business, including Nutrition Business Leader of the Year and Business Leader of the Year at the Influential Businesswoman Awards in North America. In this episode, Sonia discusses overcoming the imposter syndrome early on in her career and the challenges of working within a male-dominated industry. She reveals how she worked on a failed startup and shares the lessons from this and how a unsuccessful product launch after four years of building the product led to a fallout amongst all of the founders and lots of tension and an eventual split. She stresses the importance of customer feedback, delegation and learning from experienced mentors as the key to some of her successes. This is a really enjoyable conversation and Sonia has a lot to share. So do hold on to your seats and get ready for a really engaging conversation. This is Beyond the Fail with Sonia Kutu. Sonia, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for, for being here and today and for your time. So Sonia, take us back. Where did it kind of all start for you in business? Um, I started my career in the manufacturing space um, in accounting, and then I moved into the operations role. So um, I would work, I, I've always been in the startup space and always had like my own little side hustles, but I loved working in manufacturing uh facilities and industries where uh, we would go in with a key to a brand new plant and build that from scratch. And I would work with the founders very closely to build out an entire plant, the entire offer structure. So that was something I really enjoyed. And then from there, um, I got into tech accidentally. And uh, I've been there ever since. It's I'm going on 18 years uh, being in the tech space. Wow. So you said you trained as a, a well, let me rephrase that. You said you started in accounting. Did you, is that what you trained in or, uh, and did, you know, study in? What made you want to go into accounting? Um, I don't really, well, I do know. So I, I, I was already in manufacturing before that. And then I wanted to do something different. So I saw an opportunity for just bookkeeping and accounting. So I went to school and I took it. I was lucky that one of the manufacturing companies that I was work at, working at had a need for it. And they were like, we'll, we'll help pay, pay for the courses. We'll help with the yeah. training. Because it was such a startup environment, they needed as much help as they could get. So that's sort of how I got into the accounting. And that's also how I got into the operations part of it was by there is a need. Okay, I'll do that and then go to school. So I started doing the jobs first and I went to school later. Right, got it. I mean, it's the best, um, the best training, right, on the job. Yeah. Exactly. And why manufacturing? You said it a number of times that, you know, that was kind of your, in some ways, your, your calling. Why, why, you know, why, why the affinity with manufacturing? You know what? I'm, I'm Portuguese, 
born there, came here when I was 10. And I'm not saying it's all Portuguese people, but there was, I grew up in a little town in Ontario, Canada. And the expectation after you finish high school, I was also the middle of five. The expectation was sort of like college and university wasn't really on the map. It was like, you got to go to work. And um, everybody that I went to school with, or uh, that's just what we did. We went and worked in the manufacturing place. Um, I did take that a little further where I got lucky and I got into do different roles and I got to learn. And I, then I moved to Toronto and that sort of changed everything. But that was the reason why. It, there's nothing like super about Yeah, that. okay. It just sort of fell into that opportunity. And yeah. you said it sounded like you moved around a lot. Um, I mean, you said, you know, you already mentioned three moves uh, in the space of a few years and you obviously moved as a child. What what impact did that have on you, you know, growing up and um, to maybe some of your kind of career choices? Yeah, I think it, it, it showed me a lot of diversity going from, you know, one country to another, not knowing any English, being bullied as a child because, you know, we, we weren't Canadian. Uh, we were like, me and my siblings were the first Portuguese kids in the school. They had never had immigrants. Um, so, but it really, it, it taught us how to be tough. It taught us diversity. And then, you know, moving from a small town to a, a place like Toronto really opened my eyes outside of that small little town mentality. So I think it was just really good for diversity and learning different cultures um, meeting different people that sort of opened my horizon to better opportunities too. So when you look back on it, do you see it as a, an overall positive experience? Yes, it was an overall positive experience. It doesn't mean that it wasn't tough, but it was definitely positive because I learned a lot from it. And I'm a big believer that you always, you have to take every opportunity, even if it's a negative and learn from it and make it a positive. And given some of that kind of experience and those, you know, you said toughness that, that it kind of built inside you, what do you think that's given you in business then? Or how do you think that's helped you in business? It's definitely given me the patience to deal with different personalities, different people. I am in a very male-dominated space. And I think going from manufacturing to tech, that's really helped me because mail is very dominated, but so was uh, manufacturing. And because I, I started doing it at such a young age, it really helped me learn how to work and deal with, with, with men. So when I got into tech, that was sort of really easy for me. Uh, but it's just, it's just been, you know, learning every space, every spot that I'm in. And it's interesting you say that. You say you're in a, obviously a male-dominated industry, sticking out. And obviously, that was the experience you had at, at school, right? Which is, you said you were the only, you know, immigrants or the first immigrants in in, in your school. That's quite interesting. Yeah. It's quite an interesting parallel in some ways. Yeah, I mean, I remember me and my siblings started the ESL program at our school at the time. Right. We were the first ones, three of us. And then after other families started migrating, so you know, when they came in, there was a, an ESL program, but we were like fresh off the boat. We didn't know any English. We didn't know what snow was, had never seen it in our lives. It was just, and also when I say Portugal, like we lived on a little island. No one got out unless you were really lucky to get out. And we were surrounded by ocean all the time. So it was a really big difference to come from like a little tiny town where you know everybody and coming into a place like Canada where it's, it's completely different. And we did, we did have kids in our school that spoke Portuguese but they were born here. So it was still a huge culture uh, gap. And why did you leave Portugal? My parents just wanted to give us better opportunities. My mom's family was here. So they just felt like, you know, go, uh, for our futures, it would have been a lot better. And I do agree with them. I mean... Coming here, a lot more opportunities than being in a little island. What do you... Th how do you think your life would have panned out if you hadn't, you know, left? Do you think you'd be in, you know, in in tech and in Portugal leading leading the way? Honestly, I think about that a lot. I don't think I would be anywhere where I am now. I I hate to say it, but you know, back then, I do think that I would have ended up just, you know, getting married, having kids, and probably being like a housewife. 
or maybe working as a nurse or something. Little islands, um, there aren't a lot of job opportunities. You either work as a in a hospital or you work for the government in some capacity at the time. Now it's evolved a lot further, but I don't think I would be where I am for sure. And you said you've been thinking about it a lot. Why, why is that? Why has it come up? Because now with the situation in Canada, uh, cost of living, a lot of people are moving back to my little island. <laughs> Full circle. Yeah, and I have friends that were born in Canada and are now shipping their families there because they're just like, life is easier there. It's better for kids. There isn't as much, you know, social stuff going on. And now I'm like, huh, should I? <laughs> have you thought about it? I've thought about it. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing with, you know, obviously it wouldn't work for all businesses, but the yeah. way the world is, you work, it's work remotely, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it, you know, moving into a country that cost of living is better and just quality of life, it's, it, it's things that people are really thinking about. When we moved here in the 80s, that's what my parents were thinking about, mm -hmm. right? And now it's sort of like full circle and reverse. Yeah. And yeah, that's interesting. So you said you got into another thing you said was it since you said you you got into um, tech accidentally. How did you get into tech accidentally? Yeah, I remember at the time I was doing something temporary and a recruiter reached out to me and said, you know, there's this tech company. They are looking for accounting, some operations. So I I did like two interviews with them and they offered me the job. And yeah, that was my my foot in the door to the tech space. And how different was it compared to, you know, manufacturing? What differences did you see? I remember preparing for my interview. I went on their website and I had no idea what this company did. It, it wasn't like, even the website was very techy. And I remember trying to figure it out. And I went into, it, into the interview knew, knowing it was a tech company. But I was like, I don't actually know what they do, but I'm going to pretend that I know what they do. In fact, they built custom software which I know a lot about now but I just it was so different it was like night and day but at the end of the day you know it's it they, they're trying to achieve something and get something done so it really you know and it's just different and I was willing to put in the work uh, to learn so um, you know I was just trying to understand exactly what they did was really difficult for me because it, it was different but at the same time you know manufacturing you're building something physical and tech, you're building something, you know, online. So it's a bit different, but it's also part of the same. There's some building in there. And what yeah. and was it a um a sort of harsh learning curve? No, I'm I, I adapt really well, and I ask a lot of questions. So I'm also like I'm a very quiet person, and I'll sit there and I'll listen and I'll listen, and then I'll sort of take back what I've 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 heard, and then I'll prepare questions so that I, I can go back and, and really understand what they were talking about. So I remember like the first year I did a lot of listening. I would I would get invited to these management meetings and I had no clue what they were talking about. But I would sit there and take notes and just be a fly on the wall. And that and that was really like how I learned just by getting involved in and, and listening. And did you know then that you wanted to go on and sort of start your own company? No, I got into that by an accident as well, because um, the software development company that I was working for, we sort of had these startup ideas as a, as a team. So it was a team of founders. And because we were a tech company, we're like, well, why don't we just work off of this tech company and build, you know, the, these startups off of it? And so that's what we did. We really leveraged the experience of the team that we had in this software development company, and they helped us along the way to get to where we needed to be with, with the founding team leading it. So was that an official kind of project that you were working on, or was it kind of outside of normal hours It was that you were working on it as like a side hustle? Yeah, it was both. Right. Yeah. It took a lot of extra time and effort off hours just planning and, and doing a lot to it it's still it still is uh but yeah we, we we would have to stay late and and work and, and do extra things on it for sure so who was driving it more was it the the company or was it you guys as a team 
it was us as a team. And what were you looking at? Yeah, what was your kind of objective then? Why were you kind of getting involved in, in doing that? Yeah, we sort of came up with this idea as we were eating lunch one day. And we, someone asked the question and we were like, well, we're a tech company. Why don't we like try and build something ourselves and get it to market? That was sort of the, the concept behind it. And everyone that was at the table had a different skill set. And so we thought, okay, well, you do this, you do that, I'll do this. And then we'll, we'll get this company to actually do the physical development for us. But we had to do everything else. We had to come up with the requirements. We had to come up with, you know, the plan going forward. Um, so it really required, you know, this founding team of like four or five people to really put this plan together for how we were going to, you know, build up the startup. And what was your role? I was sort of in a little bit of everything. I was in the initial stages of, um, you know, how this, how it was going to look, what was the functionality, what was the market. I actually came up with the name. So designing the website, getting the the, the domain, uh, and just being involved in the business development part of it and the marketing. So very much kind of founder, really, like, yeah, uh, sort of driving everything. Yeah. Yeah. Was that your, I mean, did you have, did you all have official kind of titles? I mean, how, so how sort of official was it? Nobody had a title. <laughs> it was all a bit scrappy, yeah? Yeah, that's why I call it now the founding team. They all ended up leaving at some point, but you know, that there, none of us had a title. We were just trying to get stuff done. And where did, did you ever see yourself, you know, founding a company and being, you know, in the startup kind of industry was you that has always been something that was you have a dream yeah since I was very young I always had a dream I always had ambition to one day have something that I built um I've always sort of had an entrepreneur like I said even previously I I had companies that were like my side hustles Mm -hmm. I had one that ended up doing a little too well and, and it was hard for me to maintain my full-time job plus run this on weekends but it's just something that I've always done and I've always been passionate about so it's yeah it's no surprise that I ended up doing what I'm doing and where did that come from in terms of you you said that you've always had a a bit of a a drive for entrepreneurial yeah. well, where, where, yeah, where's that come from is that from did you have any sort of role models or mentors when you were younger not really I think it just came from uh, knowing that my pr- parents had brought us here uh, for a better life. And I was the middle of five, so I was already very tenacious and scrappy because I had two older siblings and two younger, and I was right in the middle. And I always knew that I wanted more than being trapped on a little island and, and not being able to achieve anything or being in a little, in a little um, city. I that. I always felt like I didn't belong growing up in those areas. So I always, I always knew that like I would one day do bigger things than just be an employee. So it's in the language you used there, like uh, about being trapped and being trapped on an island and being trapped in a, a small place. It's, it's like you were always trying to find something kind of bigger and something that fitted your ambitions. Yeah, I mean the Portuguese people that back in back in the day when I lived there, we we sort of described the island as the a jail, right? The only way to get out of it was if you had a boat and you could manage to make it past the Atlantic Ocean, or if you could afford to to fly out of it. We were fortunate because my mom had family in Canada, but when you're there, even as a child, you do feel a little trapped. I mean, you know, we elementary school there ends at the uh, grade four from grade four you go to high school and high school is just a couple of classes just a couple of grades it's not like here we have you know junior kindergarten to grade 12 and then you go off to university school system there is is very different um so it was just yeah it was just yeah you you, you sort of feel trapped and i always i want i didn't want to be in that environment and you talked about feeling um like you didn't belong, do you still feel that? No, I, I feel like I belong. I think I found my, my footing and I'm comfortable in my own skin. 
I've had, I think, a lot of uh, self-discovery through through the years, and I've I've changed. Um, I think I've I've done well because I've embraced change, although change is scary and you don't always want to do it. But I've forced myself to go outside of my comfort zone, and you know, I I went through a divorce, and that was really scary because it's like. Am I going to make it on my own and not having that support system? My family doesn't live in Toronto. They live about an hour away and I was here by myself. So there was a lot of fear, but I had to overcome that and know that I, I can do it on my own. I can make it. I've already gone through all this change in my life. So now I embrace change and I, and I know that, you know, change is going to be hard, but something good has always come of it for me. So you've uh, essentially, and obviously this, you know, this is the topic of the, of the conversation you've you've gone through hardships and you've come out the other side stronger yeah that's exactly it and and do you think that you've now got that sort of sense of belonging because well yeah what's been the main driver of that is it the fact that you know you've um where you are in your career is it where you are living you know what what, what do you think has been the main factor in you now feeling that you belong I think for a long time, there was this, there still is this saying about women who are leaders or who are, who take steps forward to not just, you know, settle. They're all, there's all all these sayings, you know, either they're, they're a B because they're very assertive or um, they're, they always describe people like that as like having imposter syndrome. And I think I, I, I had an epiphany one day where I thought I had an imposter syndrome just because of having that feeling of maybe not belonging or not having the knowledge and the school to be working in this tech space and knowing everything else that everyone else around me knew. But one thing that I discovered was everyone else was really smart school-wise books and education, but I was really good with common sense and being able to take something and doing it without knowing anything or having to study. I was really good with just learning as I go. And I I was doing that my whole life. And then one day I realized, and, and, and I thought I had imposter syndrome. And then one day I realized, wait, it's not imposter syndrome. I'm not an imposter. I know what I'm doing. I like what I'm doing. I'm quite good at it. I know I'm gonna learn. So I sort of changed that whole mentality in myself of imposter syndrome to learning as I go. So now when people ask me the question, oh, like, did you ever struggle with imposter syndrome? I'm like, no, I studied as I went. I learned as I went. Like if there's no, to me, imposter syndrome no longer exists. It's not a thing for me. I don't think I'm an imposter of, of anything. Do you think that concept exists at all? Yeah, I do. I think it's really how... You're you're either going to let people dictate that to you and believe it, or you're going to get reach a point where you're like, no, I'm not going to categorize myself that way. And I know that like in, a, in, in I'm not going to say it's male dominated. I think it's just how people think. And this happens for males and females. It's really, you know, what you put your in your brain and you tell yourself. Yeah, because for me, it's like, it's an, it's an identity. And it's a negative kind of identity and a negative story that kind of people are telling themselves, which is probably going to hold them back. Because for me, it's like a a mindset. And I really like your reframe of saying, yeah, I haven't got imposter syndrome. I'm just actually learning as I go, as we all are, essentially. We're, you know, there's that, um, that, you know, there's that kind of phrase that people say that that most people in life are just making up as they kind of go along, really. And we're, you know, that means we're, every day's a school day, and we're all constantly you kind of learning. So that's why I, I was sort of, yeah, wondering whether it, even the concept imposter syndrome exists. And actually, in some ways, it's it's a fairly negative way, way of looking at it, isn't it? And so is the fake it till you make it. I don't believe that you can fake it till you make it. Eventually, you will get caught. If you're faking it until you make it no you're learning until you make it right yep. faking it is such a negative word to me and for a long time i believed that and I, I i just think that's such a bad thing to say to someone oh you know and i used to tell people people used to tell me that all the time oh you know what don't worry about it 
fake it till you make it. What the heck does that mean? <laughs> no, exactly. Um, and you know, why, why not just be true to yourself and true to, and, and just be honest and transparent about where you are in your, in your journey. Yeah, exactly. And like faking it to me means I don't know this. So I'm going to lie and pretend that I do. And I'm just going to keep doing it. But when you don't look at it in that aspect, it's like, oh, I don't know how to do this, but I want to learn and I'm willing to learn and I'm going to put in the work to do it. So that whole, yeah, again, the fake it till you make it is, is I just, I can't even, because for a long time I struggled with it and that's why I'm sort of making an emphasis on it, but I don't anymore. I don't, I don't believe in it. I don't, I don't think you can live your whole life faking it till you make it. No, definitely not. And there's a kind of misalignment there of integrity. One yeah. thing I wanted to circle back to, because it sounded interesting, you said you had a side hustle which became too successful. Can you just elaborate on that? Yeah. Um, many, many, many years ago, I started like this little production company with my partner. And it was always supposed to be like a, a weekend, you know, evening thing. And then we found ourselves just overbooking ourselves and having to hire people to help us. So I got to the point where we had to sort of like make a decision is this what we're going to be doing? And I had to sort of manage the whole thing. So, um, you know, it, it was just, it, it became a little too big. And then I decided that I wanted, what I wanted to do was really stay in, in tech. And so I sort of let it go, but it did, it, it started out as, you know, booking one or two jobs here and there, and then, you know, having like multiple in one weekend and having to manage that. What was the business? It was, it was doing video production. Oh, video production. Yeah. What learning did you take from that? What learning? I learned that you can go from nothing and build something. Because it just based on having a passion or a hobby. Like, if you have a hobby, you can turn it into something. And that's really what it was at the time for me and my partner. It was a little hobby that we had. It was more of his hobby and... I like business and I always knew I was going to be in business. So I'm like, let's start a business and I'll help you with the business part. And you do the video part because that's your thing. And then I, I took it a little overboard on the business side and it was hard for us to, to manage all the bookings we were getting. But that just goes to say that, you know, we had no website, we had no marketing. It was all just the two of us just going out and talking to people and booking jobs sounds amazing and and um i think it's an interesting thing isn't it it's like yeah you became too successful so i had to stop it um which is a good position to be in definitely and did what did that give you confidence because essentially that's a did that give you like a proof of concept that you could kind of do it or could grow a business absolutely uh it also gave me validation that i don't need a partner or someone else to help me along the way because there was something that I realized after we were we sort of finished with that is that like I I brought a lot of value but I didn't give myself the value that I should have I always felt like I needed a a, a partner or someone to you know I was I had I lived with this fear all the time and I don't know what it was uh, but I, after I was done that I really realized that I had you know he just had a hobby and I turned it into a business for him and for me. And I, I did it not even knowing that much about business. So that really gave me confidence to say, like, now I can go off on my own and do my own thing for me and no one else. Yeah, which sounds really powerful. Yeah. And, you know, since I, that's what I've been doing, I've, I've just been working on myself and, and always constantly reminding myself that, hey, Having partners and, and founders, a team is is great, but don't forget about number one, you. Say a little bit more about that because I think that's a really interesting lesson. Yeah, I think, I mean, I'm not speaking for anyone else. I'm just speaking for myself. I think I would find myself in a place where I needed a partner because I needed validation because I didn't have the schooling that everyone else did. I was just this kid that came from a tiny little island and did did the bare minimum in school, didn't didn't get to go to university and college like all my friends did, and I just felt inferior. So having someone 
alongside me made me feel like, you know, there's someone else that knows more than I do. Even in, in tech, when we started the startup, um, one of our, our, our founders, I sort of leaned on him all the time because it was like, oh, well, you went to university, like you're going to be better than this. But to be honest with you, when the founding team left, I rebuilt that company from scratch. And today when I have conversations with that uh, ex-partner, um, or that ex-founder, he tells me all the time, he's like, the best thing I ever did was leave because I was holding you back. But I never realized that people were holding me back because I was so dependent on needing that person alongside me because I, it made me feel, it was like a comfort thing. You no, know, I'm not good enough a thousand percent, but they're going to make me good enough. Is that where the imposter syndrome came from at some points as well? I think so, yeah. But you didn't feel that you were being held back by that team and that person i realized that when he said it yes because after once that team left i had to make a decision whether i was going to continue where they had left off or where we had left off or what was i going to do with this product and i think i made a really good decision i were i shelved it for a little bit because the way we had gone about it was completely wrong and um, shelving it gave me some time to really figure out what I could do with it next so that it could be successful. Mind you, you know, at some point, founders have to make the realization, this isn't working and I'm going to stop spending money on it. Or this is a great idea and I just need to like keep going. I didn't do either. I shelved it and I said, I don't know. So I'm going to figure it out. And that's exactly what I did for about a year. I was just trying to figure it out. By the time I came back to it, I rebuilt the entire product completely. It was still sort of the same concept, but it was, but it was very different. It was new technology, uh, new requirements. It, it was completely restructured. And, and then by the time I, I relaunched it, it now had a market. Uh, and 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 we're able to to pivot during that time and and now it's a very successful product that's being sold world worldwide so i think that was the right decision to you know losing the founding team was really hard for me because it made me feel abandoned and that was something that i had to work on um i struggled with that a lot so i think making the decision to to shelf it took the stress off of me because i also had to deal with those emotions that i was feeling and if I had kept on going, I don't think I would have done a good job because I would have been my my motivation would have been I'm going to prove them wrong um, because I was angry and upset and felt all this abandonment. But taking a break really helped me just sort of um, prioritize my feelings and the product. Talking about your kind of career and um, and looking at your business ventures what has been the biggest business failure that you've encountered yeah it was with with this product where we as founders we thought we had this fantastic idea and we thought we were geniuses and we were going to change the world so this is your founding committee the ones who met around lunch the ones that each had a a, a response you know a strength and a role's responsibilities yeah and i think the downside to that was because there was a group of us we all kept encouraging each other that this was like a great product. We never doubted it for a minute. So we built it and we got it ready. And then when we launched it and took it to market, it was a complete fail. And it was a fail because it's a product that's in the, the food space that does nutrition analysis for the business B2B space. And when we launched it, we launched it to restaurant owners and chefs. And we, we, we went to them and said, hey, wouldn't it be great if you could show the nutrition information for the food that you're serving your customers. We thought we thought that was genius for the consumers to have access to this information, to help with diseases like diabetes and things like that. And then all the restaurant owners would tell us this, no, we don't want it. And we're like, why? Like, are you kidding me? If people come here and they know what they're eating, they're never gonna come back. So this, we never, we never anticipated that there would be a fear factor in what we were doing. And also in Canada, there was no company doing this at all. We were the first ones to market with this sort of program. And I think we were, we were early. We were a little too early and we didn't do enough work, to be honest. Like we got so excited about building it. We didn't do enough market analysis. 
We didn't have a, a great business plan. We just we just knew that everybody was going to want this and nobody wanted it. So I, that's when I started losing the team. People started leaving. And that's when I sort of got to a point where I was completely by myself as one of the original founders of this idea. Over what time period was this? It was around 2013, 2014. And how long did, was it from the initial kind of conception of that idea to launching it to market? Yeah, so once I shelved it, I, I shelved it from development and not spending any money on it. But on the side, I was always looking for opportunities. And in 2014, an opportunity came my way where uh, the Ontario government started making announcements that the health bill had been over budget by millions of dollars and they were looking for ways to combat that and they they did announce that uh, a lot of that had been due to diabetes which is a global pandemic and they wanted to find innovative ways to help people with diabetes um well first of all prevent diabetes and people who do have diabetes prevent them from going from you know type 2 to type 1 and things like that so um that's when we i reached out to uh public health to see if there was something were they working on anything was there anything we could do and they were actually putting together a pilot project in Ontario uh, that would put legislation in place once it was done uh, to promote our, you know having uh, nutrition information on uh, restaurant menus so we pitched and uh, our product became part of this pilot project for one year and during that time, that's when I took it off the shelf and we got to learn a lot from this pilot project because we were working with restaurant owners, chefs, dietitians, and nutritionists, and then government, of course. So there we were able to, to look at where the product was, how was the usability, number one, how, what's the, 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 the process that, you know, a nutritionist will use to do her job or a dietitian or a chef. And so we were able, I was able to really document all of that. And then we were able to bring it back and say, now we're going to rebuild based on the need that we see in the market from all this different feedback that we got. And so that's what I did after that one year uh, pilot project, because after that year, that's when the Ontario government put into place that uh, restaurants with 20 plus locations have to show calories on their menu. So we took our product from having no need and nobody wanting it to creating a bit of a demand for it. And that's really when it started taking off. And the best thing we ever did was rebuild it because if we had launched it the way it was, it would have not been able to support all of the uh, companies that ended up wanting it. And now our biggest market is actually in the US. Right. So was the biggest change between, I suppose, version one and, and, and version two, was it the fact that you got feedback um, to help shape it or was it the fact that there was a legislation change which gave you the the catalyst it was a little bit of both but it was really knowing what the end user wanted the way we had built the tool before was built for a kitchen in the structure uh, in the way that a, ki a professional kitchen cooks and we only accounted for restaurants at the time our biggest market is actually food manufacturers and the way that they do their work is very different. So we got to really learn during that process. And not only did we re rebuild the tool with the processes, we also really worked on the user interface. We wanted it to be really simple and easy to, to use. And that is the biggest feedback that we get today. It, you know, even if someone comes to us uh, looking for an alternative to a tool that they're already using, you know, we'll get clients saying I'm using a tool that was, you know, built in the eighties and it still looked like it was built in the eighties. I, I log into yours and it's just like so refreshing and, you know, two clicks gets me to where I need to be. And I think that's really important when you're building software applications, you know, making it really responsive and easy for the end user. It, it'll bring on more uh, adaptability. So that's what we really focused on is, you know, we just want, we don't want to teach somebody how to be a rocket scientist. We just want them to be able to get their job done by clicking here, here, and, th and there. And our, our first version was not that. 
our first version required a lot of work and a lot of training. Right. So what did you really do wrong in that first um, iteration and, and the first um, version of the product? We didn't talk to anybody who we were going to sell this to. We just, we talked to each other and we talked to tech people, but we never talked to the market and the industries that we were going to sell this thing to. Um, and that's really the wrong way to go about it because, you know, when you're building technology and you're on the technology side, yeah, you can do anything, you can build anything, but really the end user is the person with the power. Because they're the ones that are going to others say, yeah, say yes, this is great. I want to use it, or no, you missed the mark. So I think if we had done the work, that work up front and earlier, and learned from the end user, and and took the time to understand what were the existing tools missing that we could introduce with ours that would make our customers' lives easier. Um, we would have we would have done really great, but we completely missed that mark. We we were kind of selfish. We were so wrapped up on we have a genius idea, let's build it, yay! We're so smart that we totally missed the mark. What, do you think it was just the excitement? I mean, you met. I think um, so. really just got so good because was that the first like big idea that you had as a group? Yeah, yeah. I think we were really excited. Also. There was nobody in Canada doing this. We didn't look at the U.S. market or the European market and, right. and said, oh, there's a company since the 80s that's been doing this already. Let's learn from them and see what they're up to. No, no, no. We realized that there was competitors later. If we had done that work up front, it's okay to build a tool and to have competitors. Like, There's nothing wrong with that. When you have competitors, it's actually a good thing. It means that there's a market for your product. So if we had done that, we would have realized that, hey, there's a lot of clients online complaining about this tool, and this is what they're complaining about. So how can we fix that in our tool so that we can get those customers? How long has this business been around? What's their user interface like? What kind of features do they have? We could have done all that work ahead of time and gone to market and like really dominated, but we didn't. So we had to scale really slow. So there's a real lack of market research, really. Yeah. And there's nobody to blame on that but us. We just didn't do it. So you enough. You didn't run. We didn't do it enough. <laughs> so you didn't run any kind of like tests or have any kind of conversations with, you know, potential customers. We did with like one of the founders, his family actually owned restaurants. So we spoke to like the chefs and, you know, some of the business owners and they were like, yeah, we, we could use a tool like this, but we didn't go in like, we didn't spend months doing research. Like it was, you know, we didn't do enough at all. And I was wondering, cause you, you, you said earlier something like, um, uh, the group was really excited and, uh, that. I got the sense this is this is my take on it that there was a lot of um kind of confirmation bias in some ways and and was there was there enough conflict in your group was there enough challenge to each other or did you all just get wrapped up in the excitement of it and there's that there's that concept of group think right there's that you know that everyone just goes along with the consensus of the group do you think you had that yeah, I do think we had quite a bit of that. It did start, the dynamic did start changing when we started seeing a couple of things and then the group started disagreeing on how we were going on about it. Uh, but at that time, it was a little too late. And that's when we started losing key members because, you know, we now we're not agreeing. Okay, first we set out on this mission. And that's the thing too, founders are not exactly like the most business savvy people in the world when they start out. They're inventors. You know, the business part comes after. And I think that was part of our problem. We were inventors and we were in the inventor mindset. And the business part of it, oh, by the way, we got to make money off of this, came way after. We were just excited about building the technology. It's an interesting way of looking at it. So what did you think you lacked then? Or what do you think you needed? Yeah, I think we needed better planning. I think we needed better market research. I think we needed to be 
out in the space. So we're in the food manufacturing restaurant space, which we really should have been out there having conversations, speaking that language, understanding the space, which we've done now, but we had done it back then. Um, you know, just, I think learning to speak the language of the industry you want to go into is really important. And I hang out with tech people all the time. And one thing that we don't do is we don't speak the language of our customers. And this goes for a lot of tech, you know, industry spaces and, and startups. And we just, we get so excited about being inventors and building stuff that the business stuff comes after. And I think that's what needs to change. You know, the invention, what, once you have an idea, it needs to be set aside so that you can focus on the business part of it first and then go spend the money building the invention so that when you launch it, you have a solid business. And there wouldn't, there wouldn't be as many failures. Now, don't get me wrong, failures are good because you learn from them, but we failed miserably. And it was hard to come back from, from that fail. Uh, I was lucky that I, I like to learn and I was able to use that uh, to sort of help us pivot and lead my new team uh, to success. But it took a lot. It took a lot from me. It, it, it meant, you know, having to hire a brand new team, coach them through it. No one knew the tool and the product like I did. And, you know, business development and sales, like for a long time, I was just doing it all, all by myself. And talk us through the fallout of that, of that business. Like, how did it kind of come about? When did you start to see the wheels coming off and that the, this would wasn't going to be a viable um kind of product yeah that was like in the 2013 20, yeah 2013 is when we when i i saw that okay this isn't this isn't going to work and then 2014 was when we completely shelved it 2015 is when we did the the pilot project with public health and then we rebuilt and then we relaunched it in 2018 2019 and what were the first signs that um, you had that it wasn't going to work? Well, just nobody wanted it. We weren't getting any sales. So you you launched it as a as a product. So it was there, available to buy, yeah. and fully built. Right, fully built. So how how long did that building process take, and how much for time and money and effort did that take, roughly? Oh gosh, it took us. I think we started in two thousand and ten. Three years. It took us a good. Yeah, three to four years. And then we had to rebuild again. So um, we have we had an investor who was in, investing the development. Um, but I think one of the best things we did was when I shelved it, the investor could see that, hey, you know, they're trying to make wise decisions here and not waste money. So we could go about it the right way. But yeah, it was it was a painful process. It took a long time to to build from the get-go the rebuild was faster only took us a couple of months to rebuild and get it out because we had already learned so much from the fail you mentioned that you were obviously within a company doing this was there not any structures within that company to give you sort of i suppose support or guidance about the way to you know essentially launch a kind of startup or whether you should maybe do something as some some you know some smaller tests along the way before going into a three-year build you would think but that wasn't really what they did they they work mostly with um, enterprise solutions big companies who needed to build infrastructure software internally so they weren't big on in the startup scene now this product did get them into building startups later on uh, as they were sort of learning from us as well uh, but no that wasn't that wasn't their niche that wasn't their expertise it is now but at the time I think we were all learning I mean you're talking about like the early 2010s which is not like the tech space has changed so much like back then there weren't VCs knocking on your door you know giving you millions of dollars to build out your product we had to do a lot of bootstrap along the way and that was mostly you know, we did have an investor, but most of our work was done through Bootstrap. And from you guys investing in the product yourself, or did you get some resource from the other, you know, the company you were working for? We got resources. So we used the other company's resources. And then the pilot project that we did, we got paid for that. Right. So we bootstrapped that off of that as well. 
So when you launched and no one, no one wanted it, was there any kind of leads that came through? Or did you get any kind of feedback or was it just sort of radio silence? Yeah, no, we did. We did get feedback, which was, we don't want this because if people know what they're eating, they're not going to want it. Uh, but then we also got feedback around, and that's sort of how we found out that the government was looking at doing something because a couple of clients were like, yeah, we're hearing through the, the grape beyond and something like this is going to come up. And then we did get some good feedback from uh, smaller facilities that catered to health conscious customers like uh, restaurants that were 100% vegan or offering organic options where their consumers are, you know, conscious of, of their health. And they they did use the tool. We did get a couple um, that signed up to use it. Uh, but, you know, it just wasn't in the numbers that we expected. And what were you expecting for, for that first year in terms of your targets for sales? Yeah, we wanted to have a hundred uh, new clients using the platform so that we could take that and pivot and keep growing it. We got like five or eight. Right. And you mentioned there was tension and an argument started within the group when things, I suppose, felt like it wasn't going to go anywhere. Yeah. How did that kind of um, feel to feel to you as what I would say was the de facto leader? Yeah, I mean, there was two people in particular that was sort of always butting heads. And, and then there, there came a time where one person wanted to sort of be the leader and and uphead everything. So I think at that point, I sort of took a step back and I said, I'm not really going to get involved that much in this. So I, was, I sort of stayed in the background and, and watched and contributed as much as I could. But at that point, I sort of took a step back and then I sort of let them, you know, go at it. And then eventually that person ended up leaving because it just became a lot. And, you know, they they wanted to to lead and they wanted to be the CEO. And that's when the titles sort of started coming in, right? And I was still of the mindset, like, I'm not a person who cares about titles. I still don't. Um, so I was just like, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be involved in, in this. But I still I still did my work. I still stayed involved. But I knew, I think eventually I knew that it was gonna all come crashing down or everyone was going to butt heads and we were going to have to make decisions on where to go next. But I don't like confrontation, so I just avoided it like a plague. It's interesting that they wanted to be a CEO of a, of a, of a product that uh, it was just launched and no one wanted. <laughs> and that conflict, was there... Because I'm just... I, I suppose I'm interested to hear the reactions of the, you know, the group on what they thought you should do because I imagine the conflict was over people couldn't agree on the course of of action well you know like there was a couple of things so there was the technology the platform that we had decided to build it on some people didn't agree with it I, I remember one day I came in and one of the developers had like completely rebuilt the app from scratch without anybody telling him to do it and he was like, yeah, I built it on this, you know, platform because it's just going to be better. And we're like, we never asked you to do that. And then like the technology was, we knew that it wasn't going to be, it was a Microsoft technology. We knew that Microsoft wasn't going to be supporting it. They had already announced this. So we're like, you stayed up all night doing this? Like why? So there was that, the technology part of it. And that really set, set us back I, I, because we spent all this time building. And then there was like, who are we going to sell this to? Well, we're selling it to restaurants. We, and it was like this stubbornness of like, this is going to be our market. And as we kept going out and having conversations and people kept saying no, no one really stepped up and said, you know, let's go after a different market. It was always, it's going to be restaurants or, or healthcare. This has got to be it. And they just kept beating a dead horse, right? So that started building conflict around like, what, what industries are we going to take this thing to? And then every day somebody had a new idea. Well, let's go into retirement homes and let's go into this and let's go into that. And then everyone's head just started spinning because now you're desperate. Your idea didn't go the way you wanted it to go. Um, you're not selling it to the original market that you intended to sell it to. And now you're just, you're, you're casting a wide net hoping that something comes in. 
but you could have, you know, just like when you're fishing, you could have like 20,000 different species come in that, in, in that net, which one is the right one, <laughs> right? And that's sort of what we were doing. And we were just spinning our, our, our heads and, and it wasn't going anywhere. And, I, and, I, and that's when the frustrations started happening and where people started giving up and just saying, yeah, this isn't going to work. This is never, this tool is never going to take off. We're never going to make it a business. So I'm out. So did people leave one by one like Domino's? Yeah. Over what kind of time period did, you know, how many months was it that people left? Year and two, but year, between a year and two, people just started. And then you were left all on your own? Yeah. With that product, yes. And... You said earlier it's um, a founder's kind of obligation to work out when to shelve something or when something's not working and which direction to, to go. I just want you to say a little bit more about that because I know there will be people out there that you know might be in business and their business might not be going so well. You know, They might have had a downturn or they might have started something that's not going as expected and I think that it's probably one of the hardest decisions to make as a business owner whether to carry on or mm -hmm. to quit and there is you know lots and lots of I suppose uh you know business resources and 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 people out there that that say carry on carry on in business carry on what you're doing and time is the is the biggest kind of factor in your success and actually it's important to you know to carry on and there's there's so many stories of of companies that have succeeded over time after having lots of setbacks on the way but at what point is it that you feel that you know actually the business shouldn't continue and that they should just either completely shut it down or pivot to something else yeah it's a good question and it's a hard one to answer um because like uh startups are always you know they're being run by people that are very tenacious and if they had like this what you call a negative mentality of like oh i'm not gonna be like think positive and go and and, and make it successful then they're almost seen like as a failure so a lot of the founders are like, failure is not an option. I got to keep going. And that's sort of what keeps driving them. I think it's really like whether you're investing your own money or you have an investor, if you get to a point where you have you, you, you've, you've brought in all of this investment and it's, it could be a year or two or it could be a figure, maybe it's half a million or a million or two million in and you still are not making any revenue, for me, that's when I would stop. Like if I was a million in investment in and I'm still not launched or I'm launched, and I'm not bringing in revenue, I'm not gonna spend investors money any longer. Like I need to figure out what I'm gonna do with this. It doesn't mean you're gonna give up. It doesn't mean you're a failure. It means you are managing people's money properly and you're not taking advantage of them, right? Because that happens a lot. Also with VCs, you know, they say a VC will only make uh, the, the companies that they, the startups that they invest in, 20% will succeed. That's a huge loss. Mind you, the ones that succeed usually do really well, but that's still a big loss. And I think the loss comes from people not being careful with other people's monies. I see companies that are like $5 million in and they're still in research and development, right? I think you need to really plan it out. I always, you know, if I would go, if I could go back in time and do it all over again, what I would have done was I would have spent very little money on an MVP. Like, let's say I made the same mistake and I didn't do all the market research. Let's say that, right? With an MVP, a minimal viable product, the cost of building that would have been 60% lower. And I would have been able to take that to market sooner and identified all of the issues that I found when we built the full version, right? So I think that's sort of where, where you need to get to. Like if you've launched and you're half a year or a year in and you're not generating revenue where you can start bootstrapping and maybe not taking on as much investment, I get that when you, you grow or you pivot or you hit 
a certain plateau. You need an investment in order to continue the, the growth. But I would just say like if, if you get to, if, you, if you've launched and you're not at the capacity of bringing in some sort of revenue, even if it doesn't pay back the investment yet, if, you, if, you, if you're not able to generate a couple of clients worth of revenue, there's something wrong. If you need to continue collecting investment to keep building out this feature, but you can't sell it, how is the build out and the go, going to help you? Like, are you really understanding what the problem is? Or are you just putting money into your invention because you're passionate about it? So you basically want some, to see some traction. Yeah. I think traction is, is how you go about it. Like, um, now we're at our product. I recently built what I call the customer advisory board. Startups always build out their director um, board, right? To get advice. And I said, no, you know, that, that doesn't work for us because what we really need is we need our clients to tell us what they need and what they want. So we built up this, this customer advisory board so that our clients can tell us directly what they need, what they want. So we can build not you know, AI features that are cool. We want to build features that are really going to bring you value and you're going to pay for the tool in order to do that. So if you're not talking to your customers or your potential customers to understand the problem that you're really solving, like, are you really solving that problem with that AI that costs like, you know, a million dollars to build? Do you really need that? You've got to put in the work to understand that. And I'm not saying that like, I know it all because obviously we failed and I wish I had known and it, took like a lot of years for me to learn all this stuff, but it did get to a point where I learned. I, I, I know I have a friend who has been at it, this one tool for eight years. And I'm always like, how many clients do you have? You're eight years in like, and, and he's got no investors putting in his own money. And I'm like, how many clients do you have? And he still doesn't have any. And, and, and I try to tell him like, I think it's time for you to like, let it go, but he won't. He won't because he's passionate about it. As you said, that's the inventor. That's the inventor in him, yeah. Yeah, not not because you're coming at it from with that business uh, mindset, aren't you? And and yeah, he's still yeah. stuck in in his in his science lab by the sounds of things. Yeah, but but think about it. There's like pros and cons to that, right? Like if Ford had stopped, you know, if the if the first car didn't work and he stopped doing it we maybe we still wouldn't have a car or an airplane right they fail so many times before they became successful so the failures are, are are really really good the problem is when they're not going anywhere what was the lowest moment of that failure and that business you know not and that product not working yeah i think it was just knowing that i had put so much effort and time into this and that it was all, it all felt like a huge waste. I could have been doing something bigger and better. Like this is a tool that we thought was going to change people's lives. At one point we had like a little slogan for it, which was called choice is healthy. Like we just thought people are going to be healthier because of this. They're going to live better life. We were huge advocates for um, health tech, and tech for good so you know not just tools that are you're on your phone all day doing nothing like things that are gonna impact your life and we're disruptors right like that was the other thing we were disrupting a, a, a traditional space which was send food to a lab to get analyzed and here we are doing it with software and then all of a sudden you completely fail and you haven't achieved any of those things and you haven't and you haven't had an impact on any industry or people's lives and 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 then you get left alone. So it was a very it was it was low, and it really sucked. <laughs> Definitely, did that feed into your feelings of imposter syndrome and inferiority? All these other sort of words you used earlier. No, I think that's always been in me. As I, I think I think that I think I had that because of being an immigrant and feeling inferior by not being in my environment. Um, so I think I had that way before. But yes, that comes to surface when you fail at something. And did that, how much of a knockback and setback was it kind of, did it sort of knock your your, your confidence? Did it take a, a while to kind of 
recover your kind of belief? No, no, because I'm very tenacious and I, I had something to prove at this point. I was like, you know what? I still think it's a good idea. Um, now I'm just going to prove that we went about it the wrong way. I'm going to do the work that we should have done. And I'm going to, I'm going to prove that there, there is a market for it and that we can make it, make it successful. Now it wasn't successful right from the, the relaunch, but you know, I kept working at it to make it happen. And I kept learning from mistakes and from all the stuff we had done previously to make sure that we weren't repeating ourselves. And now I have a team and, you know, sometimes my team hates me, but I'm always like, my, my thing is if you do something for three months and it doesn't work, stop doing it. And they hate me for it because they're like, oh, well, that's not enough time to gauge or, or I'm like, no, I, I don't care. If it doesn't work for three months, stop doing it. Think of a new way to do it or keep doing it, but add something new. So my marketing team all the time, you know, they want to do the keep, they want to keep doing the traditional marketing stuff. I'm like, no, if you've been doing, I'm not going to spend money doing this for a year when I know it's not going to work. We got to do other innovative, uh, other innovative things. Same thing with building features. So my team sort of hates me sometimes, but they really love me. But I have this rule three months, you know, um, I, I hired a new SEO company to help us like with our website. And three months in, I wasn't seeing the results I was expecting. We fired them. <laughs> and my marketing team didn't want to. They're like, oh, I don't think it's enough time. I'm like, no, I'm done. I want to see results now. They need to prove themselves. Just because I'm a little, you know, I worry when things are not showing results that I'm repeating myself. Now, mind you, that might take me to another level. But it's always it always turns out better because we're always innovating and we're always looking for new ways of doing things. So we're not stuck doing it for like a year or six months. And then a year later, oh, we spent a hundred thousand dollars on this, but it didn't work. We don't get to those points because I also run a very lean, um, company. Like we're not, you know, just throwing money at everything. It has to be very lean and it has to work. So it sounds like one of your key lessons is that you now move quicker on things and you're now looking to, I suppose be less patient and giving things a lot of time to maybe bed in or, or, or settle down. Yeah, for sure. I mean, like a couple of years ago, we built a feature in the system that we thought was going to completely change it. Um, we didn't spend a lot of money. It was sort of like an MVP version of it. And when I real, when we took it to market and I realized, you know what, only about like 30% percent of our clients really need this. We're going to keep it, but we're not going to spend any more money building it out even further. And it's still there and we've like tweaked it a little bit here and there, but I didn't go out and spend, you know, two, three, four hundred thousand dollars on building out this massive feature because that's really not what people wanted. So I pay a lot of attention to those little details. And by the sounds of things, one of the other key learnings, you're very much now customer feedback focused. Yes, our, our customers run our um, roadmap. So I me I personally do this with our customers. We give them updates in our newsletter of things that are in the roadmap, what we've built, what's in um, uh, what's in testing or what's being tested by a third party, what's coming up, and building out that actual roadmap and identifying when things are going to get built out is based on customer needs. So if we have fifty customers asking for this same feature, that becomes priority. And now we're adding value. Now we're keeping our clients instead of them canceling with us and going somewhere else. And the value of that is, is also that they get new features built that they're not paying for as customization. We're putting it in our roadmap that's built on our costs and they're going to get to contribute to how they actually want it to work there. We're going to, we're going to work with them to get all the requirements. And then when we launch all of our customers get access to it. So it's really it, it's developed like a really good relationship and trust with our customers because a lot of our competitors, um, you know, COVID prices went up. A lot of clients are coming to us who feel cheated and treated really badly by their existing vendor. I had a customer reach out to me who had been with a vendor for over 30 years and the vendor went to them and said, your renewal is up in three days and it's going up five times the price and they couldn't afford it. 
right? And they're just like, I can't, like, I just, I'm a small business. I can't afford that. And they gave me three days of notice. So there's a lot of stuff happening. And we just want to make sure that our bottom line is make taking care of our customers. The technology is second. The, the customer is first. What other learnings did you have from, from that experience? I think I, I learned how to work, be a better leader from having worked with the founding team, uh, losing that founding team, going at it alone, um, you know, know, knowing that I, I shouldn't be a believer that if I got to do something right, I got to do it myself, delegating. Uh, I think it's, I, I think my, my biggest learning was that I became a much better leader. What in particular did you do? You think you, yeah, you kind of built in your leadership skills. Delegating. Was that hard before? Was that something you struggled with before? Yeah, I mean, I was a big believer that if I wanted something done right, I had to do it myself, and I had a very hard time letting go of things, and it 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 overworked me to a, a huge degree, and then I got sick. And I had to take care of my health and I couldn't do everything myself. And that taught me a, a tough lesson on, you know, if you hire someone, like, let's say, let's use an example. If I hire a marketing manager, obviously I'm hiring a marketing manager because I'm not a marketing manager, right? So why am I going to do that person's job for them? And why am I going to micromanage them? And why am I going to be on them, right? There's a reason why I'm paying you is because I I don't know how to do it and I need you to do it. So I'm I've I've turned that my mentality around uh, about that and now I'm I'm more of you know I got I got to hire people that are smarter than me. Got to hire people that know more than I do so that I can learn from them and they'll learn the stuff that they need from me and we can work together. So I think that makes a, a more dynamic team. It makes the team uh, uh, have trust in me. They know that I trust them to do their job. There's no micromanaging, which also creates a good culture. I mean, not every day is perfect, right? But I think it's it's changed like a thousand percent. And those were just from hard lessons that I had to learn as a leader. Do you think some of that is because you know you're able to uh, delegate better and? let go and and not micromanage and trust your team more do you think that's come from you feeling more confident in yourself and and going beyond that um that imposter syndrome and that inferiority kind of complex that we talked about that you're more self-assured and therefore you can then trust others that's a really good point i haven't really thought about that but i think i think i think it's a little bit of both but you're right. I think it's because I've also built a lot more confidence, a confidence, and I know what I'm capable of. Um, so I'm not so afraid of letting things go. I know my job is to make sure that we're successful. And by doing that, in order to get there, I have to help my team be successful. And that's by supporting them, not by being, you know, just a, a micromanager or you know, being on their, behind them all the time, checking on what they're doing. I'm, I think more of the approach of when they do something, I'll give them feedback. And then they'll take that feedback and they'll do their job and then they'll come back. What do you think now? I'm like, great job. And then they'll continue, right? So I try to give more direction. You know, just this week I, I went to my team and I'm like, guys, you're depending on me too much recently like i need you guys to back off because i need to focus on business development like i have all these events coming up and we have trade shows i want to be there because i want to be having conversations with our customers i can't be here doing this stuff and they're like yeah we understand right so i also have to push back sometimes when they're depending on me too much yeah it's a strong message to say to your team i think that's yeah. a hard message to say as well but it, it in some ways it's empowering to them to for you to say actually you need to kind of step up a little bit but that gives them the the confidence to know that you, you kind of trust them yeah. you talked earlier about the founding team leaving you and abandoning you as the word you used that mm -hmm. sounded pretty difficult 
period. Was that one of the the lowest points as well, personally for you? Yeah, I mean, it, it wasn't just because they, you know, there were people I worked with and left. It wasn't that. They were my friends. And they were people that I cared about and people that I had in my life. And a lot of, you know, one of them like moved to another country or, you know, they moved, they live in another city and they're not in my city anymore. And it was just, and I think I used the word abandoned because that's, that's how I felt. I don't think they really like abandoned me. I'm still friends with some of them, but that's how I felt because to me, they didn't really think about the aftermath of their decision and I guess I respect the decision when when you feel like you failed at something it's like I gotta move on and, and do something else I, it just so happens that I was the only one who didn't but yeah I it, it I it, it was an abandonment thing for me because I'm still here and you're all gone and you all gave up and essentially you gave up on me because I'm still the one here right so I felt really alone and also you know as a as a founder, it's a really lonely place. If you have a co-founder, great. You have someone to bounce ideas off of and you have someone to vent to or, you know, you can go for a coffee and just talk and vent and say your, talk about your frustrations and things like that. And I had nobody to do that with. And I think that was, it just, it, it, it created like this buildup in me of frustration that I, I had no one to release it with. So it just it piled up in my brain and, and just sort of gave me the sense of abandonment. You said an interesting thing, which was they gave up on you. Is that how it kind of felt? Or you, you took it to heart? Yeah, I did. <laughs> I really did. I don't think, I don't know if that's right or wrong. It's just how I felt, you know, because we put a lot of work and I put a lot of work into this thing and I, I'm, I'm, you know, doing the work. I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'm, I did way more than a lot of people did. And when things are finally starting to look up, you leave and you just leave me here and you don't like bye bye. Yeah. It, it was, it was, it was like a, a knife in the back. Right. And that, that's just how it felt. I've gotten over it. It took me a couple of years. But it was a huge sense of abandonment. Did you ever discuss any of that with them? I did with one of them. We've had many conversations about it. But you didn't at I mean, the time. Was, no, no, it was it was just hush hush. We didn't we didn't address it because someone was going to blow up. It sounded like a bit too raw as well, maybe. Yeah, I mean, I've had my moments with this one particular person where I've vented. But I think he understands too my frustration, and now we're at a place where we can sit down, talk about it. And I have days where I'm like really frustrated, and I'll text him. I'll be like, "Do you have time for a coffee? I need like I need to vent." And it's actually kind of nice now that I have someone who's not here, who's outside, but sort of understands that I can go to and and have those conversations with. So I've you know I've been able to turn around some of those relationships, and now they're 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 you know, people in my life that add value to to me. Do you think that the second iteration of the product would have worked with that founding group? No. Why is that? Maybe I'm wrong. I just don't think it is because we had too many chefs in the kitchen. How many was in the group? Five or six. What do you think is the the limit then to a a, a founding kind of group three (laughs) yeah i think uh a business person uh a tech person and a person sort of in between that's focused like on the marketing and the sales side of it i think i think those are three really good people or or uh roles uh like a cto a co-founder and a founder so cto focuses on the technology co-founder focuses on you know, sales and marketing, founder focuses on uh, business development, partnerships and things like that, right? And now you have a really good combination of all three aspects that are really important at the startup level that you can grow. If you have more people in there, it's just going to create chaos. So do you think that was another mistake that you guys made was that there's just too many of you? Yeah, definitely. 
But could it have been any different? I, I don't know. It's hard to tell because we all came up with the idea one day just sitting around eating lunch. <laughs> so it was sort of like we've all had, we all participated in this idea. We can't kick anybody out. You know what I mean? Yes, that's cool. It was sort of that concept, yeah. And the other question I had was, again, it kind of, I don't know what the word is, reflective. If that legislation had come in earlier, do you think mm -hmm. that that first iteration of the business would have succeeded the way that your second did? It would have done better, um, but it would have still required some redevelopment, some technology changes, but it would have been better because we would have learned a lot more at that time versus learning it later. But yes, if that legislation had been in place, I think we would have done a lot better. Because I think it's, a, and you said it earlier, it's it's always an interesting concept of timing. You know, when is a product launched? Is it is it hitting the right time? And I, I a lot of uh, the people I've had on this podcast talk about it was actually to the wrong time. I was too early. And you said that you, you were too early in that business. And then obviously a few years passed and then it kind of sounded like the right time. And, yeah. you know, it's so difficult as a founder to predict the timing and when you're too early. And, you know, if we think back to all of the the kind of early social media platforms, MySpace, Friendster and stuff that were early, and then obviously you had the successes after. Yeah, I don't know what, what, what your thoughts on, on sort of that t of timing. How do you, is there a way of sensing that? No, I definitely think it, it is a, timing thing i i also feel that if if you're if you're too early to market man you really have the benefit you if you're smart about it you can do like myspace why did myspace stop existing they didn't pivot right they had dominated the space why didn't they learn from these other startups that are coming up and adapt to what they were doing they'd still be around i think um, so it's, if you're, if you're early on, that's not a bad thing. Yes. Timing is not great, but that's when you really have an opportunity to, to learn, right. And you can take your time learning. And by the time the right timing comes along, you're ready for it. So you're seeing it as a positive. Yeah. I think I, what I'm saying is you can make it a positive if you choose to. <laughs> So it's how you approach it. You sort of see it as a kind of learning uh, exercise. and Yeah. So what advice would you give to new entrepreneurs about how to handle the fear of failure? Because it's quite a common thing. People get held back. They don't want to fail. They don't want the shame of failure. It's something I hear quite a lot. What would you say to those people? If you don't fail, you're, not, you're never going to be successful. So take failure as a positive turn it into a positive because failure is going to make you tenacious. And, you know, if you don't fail and everything is just going right all the time, you're not learning a whole lot. And I hate to say it, but failures are really like your biggest lessons. You got to fall. You got to crawl before you can walk and falling, you know, teaches you like it, it's just such a basic concept. We, we, we go through it as a children when we're learning how to eat and, and, and walk. I think we need to keep applying that in our lives and, and looking at it as, you know, when I was a child learning to walk, I fell like a million times, but it was that falling that taught me how to walk. And we need to stop thinking of the falling as a bad thing or, uh, you know, it's, People are going to look at me badly. I'm a failure. No, I think we need to turn it around just like the imposter syndrome or make fake it till you make it, right? It's, it's not. If, if you have failed, people should look up to you because you failed and then you either scrapped it, built something new, built, um, focus, uh, built something new based on what you learned from those failures. And maybe it's a completely different business, but you learned, you learned from that failure. And we got to start looking at that as, as positives. And the other piece of advice I would give is go to retired business people and the older um, generation, they have been there and they have done it and they know 
so much. Two of my mentors are like older gentlemen and they're, it, you know, I'll set up like a one hour Zoom call with one of them to just go over a couple of things and it'll be like three hours later and we're still there and I'm still asking them questions. Like it's really up to me to pick their brain and get the information that I need out and they're willing to give it to you and contribute. Now, yes, generation, there is a generation gap you know, maybe things are not done the same way, but business is business and how you run a business is the same and how you go and look for clients or how you treat your clients, how you build a team and treat your team. Not much of that has changed. It's still a lot of it. It's still the same. So I would say if you are thinking about building a startup, if you're going to get into that space, get a mentor early on. It doesn't have to be a board member or a whole board advisory board. Just get someone who's willing to give you an hour of his time in one month just so you could pick his brain and learn from what he has done or she. Yeah, that's great advice. And is that something you regret not having when you were in this, you know, founding group? Because it didn't sound like you had much outside uh, sort of support. I thought I did in some of the other, of the older people in the group because I, I think I was the youngest. Uh, but yes, I, I do wish I had had that earlier on. And when did you realize that that was so important and so integral? Honestly, when I started going out and networking in the industries I wanted to be in and going out to tech companies and just getting out there and talking to people and being like, wow, like, I really like what you just said to me. Can I, you know, buy you a coffee and pick your brain for a little bit? Because that's when I started realizing there's all this knowledge out there that I need that I don't know. And I, if I'm going to continue learning, what am I going to do? Take a course? I'm not great at taking courses. I don't want to read a book. I want to have a conversation and I want to learn. And so that's just what I started doing because it works for me or for someone like. Yeah, I think it's so fundamental. Yeah. So final question. If you could go back in time and stop that failure from ever happening and ever existing, would you do that? Oh, you're just asking me these tough questions. Um, I would, I, I want to say yes, because then we would have been so much further along. But I think I, I, I don't think I would change it. I think I would make changes in the, the team very early on. But I don't think we, I don't think you could go back and change a failure, because then, you know, I wouldn't be where I am now if that failure hadn't happened, and it, it gave me this opportunity to grow. Um, so I guess my answer is no. I would. And it's interesting to, you know, if it hadn't failed, would, yeah, would you have the version of that, that product that you had today and would you have made that pivot? Yeah, see, I, I don't know. I, I, if it had succeeded, we probably would have just kept going after the same market, kept building the, the features for that market. We would have never, like our pivot was massive. We went into, you know, we went from, selling to restaurants, selling to food manufacturers. And we were able to change our, our costing by going into a completely different market. So if we had, if it had worked and not failed, we, I think we probably would still be very much trying to sell to restaurants or selling to restaurants and it would have been successful. And we probably would have never done the pivot because the pivot, we also had to rebuild to fit to that market needs. Uh, they, the way they go about building things is very different. So we had to build features specific for their workflows. So if 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 we had not failed and restaurants were doing great, we probably wouldn't have put in the money and the effort to to change the the tool. Fantastic. So we always finish on a quick fire round. So this is uh, short questions and and short answers. Okay. So failure is success. What is your life's mission? To not fail. <laughs> Again. Okay. What's one piece of advice that you'd want to give people on your deathbed? Make time for the things that are important. Nice. Name one habit that keeps you resilient. Reading. If you could be immortal, would you take it? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's a very strong no. Why is that? I don't want to live forever and do this over and over and over again. <laughs> I think it needs to stop at some point. 
What's one surprising fact that not many people know about you? I was with my family on the uh, Family Feud Canada. For non-Canadian listeners, do you want to say a little bit more about what that is? It's uh, it's a, a TV show. You guys have it in the US. It's called Family Feud. Uh, no, I'm in the UK, so not sure what it's called over here. Yeah, it's called Family Family Feud. Okay. Um, I have to look that up. I'll put it in the show notes. And who could you recommend do you think I should have on as a guest? Okay. Uh, you should have Sheetal Jaitley. Uh, he's also Canadian. Uh, he actually lives in Miami, Florida, and he is the founder and CEO of a company called Tribal Skill. Him and I actually worked together for many years in the software development space, and he's gone off and just built a, a new company. He's involved in product development. He's an investor. So he's got like a world of knowledge around failures, success, Perfect. and being, and just building companies and helping founders and being on board. Amazing recommendation. Thank you for that. So, Sonia, where can people connect with you and find you? Yeah, so I actually have a website. It's uh, sonyakudo.com. All of my LinkedIn, Instagram handles, uh, podcasts, everything is on there. Uh, you can reach out. I get all the emails. So all my information, who I am, what I do is all there. Perfect. I'll put that in the show notes. And you've also got a podcast, which I will um, put in there as well. So, Sonia, thanks so much for being here and for sharing your uh, story and and all of those insights around that failure. Um, I think it's been a, a great episode. So thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to Beyond the Fail. Really hope you enjoyed this episode and learned something new. Please do subscribe to the show and leave us a review. It really does help us to grow and to reach more people. Do follow us on social media too. We're at Jeswood on Instagram and at Beyond the Fail on YouTube and also on Linktree. Thanks again and see you soon.